you always hope for the bug of a lifetime. When it comes. Will you be ready? Zero. it is time to do our memory presentations. Um, Carly, would you like to go first? Sure, I'll go. Dad and I. My bedroom lights turned on. I saw my dad standing at the door. He told me to get ready. It was the last turkey hunt of the season. As I got up, I kept thinking about when to shoot the turkey, where to shoot it, I went to the kitchen and my dad had my clothes ready for me. So I went back into my room to get changed. After, I grabbed a couple snacks and went back into, and, it, and went into my dad's truck. As we were driving there, I tried to take a nap because it was very early in the morning. I slept very lightly in the truck. I do not sleep very well in places I'm not used to. As we got there, I was very nervous and I was shaking. As I walked to the blind, I told myself I can't. But my dad heard me and told me that I would be fine and that I would be great. I got into the blind and went on my tablet and played my favorite game. Suddenly, we saw two very big turkeys coming in toward, coming toward us very fast. Me and my dad hurried to get the stuff ready, but by the time we got by, I got I got by the gun, it was too late. After that, I was devastated. I thought I had missed my chance to shoot my first turkey. Later. Me and my dad ate all the snacks in less than two minutes. It was only 9.30. As time passed, me and my dad got so hungry, we got so bored. And normally my dad can be occupied by his phone for at least four hours. Dad, can we please get something to eat? And I asked. My dad said yes. I'm very hungry too. But don't you realize that we might miss the turkey? I nodded my head. So we drove to McDonald's and hurried back to camp. Afterwards, I went back on my tablet and did my schoolwork. And time passed very quickly. It was getting dark, and I started to lose hope. Then a crow called, and we heard two turkeys gobble almost 15 yards ahead of us. I put my tablet away and got to the gun. I told myself, now or never. My dad told me to shoot the big one on the left. I got the gun aimed on the turkey's neck and squeezed the trigger. Bam! Whoa! Yes! I opened my eyes and watched the turkey go down. I heard my dad make a very joyful scream, and I started crying in joy. But the other turkey stayed. Whoa! We got two! Carly, what just happened? Two of them. We doubled up. Are you excited or what? <laughs> yes. Yeah, let's, you want to go see? Yes. Come on, baby. Hunting with my dad is a blessing. I love my dad in hunting with him. And that's my story of dad and I. A few years ago, my dad arrowed a giant brown brown Kodiak. And since watching that film, it's become an obsession of mine to follow in his footsteps and do it myself. 
I always wondered if I'd get the chance, and if I did, could I do it? Would I even have the nerve to get within bow range of a giant brown bear? This spring, the opportunity of a lifetime came up. I was gonna try. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. I had one friend, now there's none. I made the devil run. I broke so many bones, but none of them were ever my own. They were an army, I was alone. I broke so many bones. I now know what my dad was talking about when he said, no other animal inspired so many feelings. There's truly no way to describe the feeling of knowing that you did follow in your dad's footsteps. There's a lot of dreams in my life that I plan on living out. I am blessed to have been able to check off one of them on Kodiak. Son, may you always be able to look back at this and remember just how awesome you really were. Yeah, was You already knew how to cherish every September sunrise. You have undoubtedly always been my lucky charm. You always had the best seat in the house, right there on daddy's back. Because of all the time that we spent in elk country, it's safe to say that that was your first love. Daddy shot the cow. <laughs> Good job, dad. I'm gonna have pass. Knuckles, headbutt. What do we say to the cow, buddy? A cow, we say. We say oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. You were already a better elk caller than I was. It was amazing, some of the things that you would sleep through. Are you ready, Bo? You have always been my best hunting partner, because you were always so supportive and so ready for anything.
you were right there on my back for the one that got away and then you were right there again for the one that daddy passed up. How many people can say that they called in a bowl for their dad when they were only two years old? I can! Daddy got the bowl! High five! Knuckles, headbutt, I love you. Yeah, you. Huh? How cool is that? Hi, bowl. Now we say thank you, bowl, huh? Thank you, bowl. a few things. Matt had to take his son to school. It's starting to snow now. It's a lot cooler today. Um, we're coming back to the same stand we shot him last night. We just glassed up the flat and it's got I-9, the giant nine pointer in there. He's got a doe. And we're doing the same shit. Uh, we're belly crawling in again because we at least saw one doe's head. We're just going to have to use this grass and belly crawl all the way in. Because there very well could be a good buck with her. So but We left the bow in the tree and everything. So gotta get in there. Same story, very next day. Let's do it. We got picked by the doe. However, we don't know. We don't know if they've ran off or not. So we're down here in the creek. We're gonna dump right up this, this notch here. See if we can't see them. Still in there. So we start heading back in here, glass the deer up. Pretty crazy, pretty crazy, right? Another deer laying in here on a flat, right? So we get get pretty close to the area. Still doing the same thing, belly crawling along the fence like we did yesterday. We're walking, just walking into the property. We left a bow and camera in the tree, and Matt just says, glass them up. So there was deer, right? Basically. 50, 60 yards from our stand, and it's a giant. We know what deer it is, and uh, it's a deer we call I know. One phone call that's getting made before anybody. Hey. Daddy just shot a big buck. Yep. Well, we gotta go find him before we do anything. Jesus Christ, Matthew. Nope. We crawled 300 yards, climbed up this tree, and shot him within 20 minutes. And he is an absolute giant. He's an absolute giant. I mean,
The ideal man is his own best friend and takes delight in privacy. I think that's why that me and old Kev were so close. We're a lot alike, but there's a lot of years between us. We like the outdoors and we like to be by ourselves hunting. I think that's why we were such good friends. So, this bow is probably five years older than me. It's super special to me because okay. it was passed down to me from a very special man that sadly lost the battle to cancer this year. I'm just hoping I can kill a big buck with it this year for old Kev. Uh, I'm hoping he can smile down at me and it'll just be epic if we can make that happen.
morning we had some luck, but it was all bad luck. Um, I had a pretty decent buck at 30 yards and just skimmed his belly, but it is super windy out here. I can't imagine myself slinging an arrow doing this. Nailed him! Let's go! Let's go! Oh. oh, he's down! I just watched. Oh, he just fell over! Let's, let's go! I wasn't really prepared for the emotions I was gonna have walking up to that boat. Oh. Losing Will Kev was tough. Uh, I'm only 12 and that, that was the first experience of loss I've actually felt. I am super blessed and thankful that I got to shoot the biggest buck I've ever killed with a bow, with his bow. And it was just an awesome experience to have. I'm hopeful and happy that him and I both know Jesus, and I can't imagine that there's not a November in heaven, so I'm pretty certain that I'll be able to hunt with him again someday. But until then, I'm going to keep killing deer with his old bow. I'm going to keep bringing him my arrows and telling him my stories. So that way, we don't have so much to catch up on when I do finally get there. Dave Wooten, 41 years old, retired Army paratrooper. When I was eight years old, my father took me out on my first hunting trip. It's my last memory of having a father. So I was lost, depressed, angry, angry at the world, not knowing what I needed to do in life. Um, so I got into drugs, alcohol, everything I could do to party with friends and feel that, that love that I was missing from having a father. How can there be a God that takes an eight-year-old kid's dad away from him? I met my high school sweetheart when I was a senior graduating high school. When I was 25 years old, she broke up with me, what I considered to be the last time. So I came home one night after that and talked to my mom and said, look, you know, I'm gonna go enlist in the army. Because if I don't, I'm gonna be dead or in jail. This is the height of the Iraqi invasion. And, and I deployed in July of uh, 2006 to, to Crete, Iraq, to do some pretty gnarly uh, missions. Some bad guys were on the deck of cards. We rode in a Chinook helicopter and uh, basically hovered uh, to our objective. And immediately as soon as I hit the ground, I felt my leg, my leg explode. I had torn my, my ACL, my MCL, and my PCL all in one instance. Basically, that was the end of my military career. 
Uh, I went to see an orthopedic surgeon and he said, you need multiple, multiple surgeries. Your, your leg's destroyed. Two days after that, I was told that, uh, I was called by my section sergeant saying, hey, we're, we're deploying again. We're going back over. I didn't have to go because I was broken. And I didn't know if I had a purpose anymore. Um, I went through a med board process while my guys were over in Iraq. Um, seven of the guys that I had spent the last two years of my life with, training with, getting to know their families, died at once. The sad thing was, is I could have been on the truck. And I don't know if it's survivor guilt knowing that I could have been on that truck, survivor guilt knowing that I was home having a good time with my wife and kid, but it wrecked me. And that was the start of this hatred of myself and not knowing what I wanted to do. Came home to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I was not the same guy. Uh, it was almost scary. For two years, I didn't leave my couch. That was my day. I would drink, take my pills, sit on the couch, and play Call of Duty. Neglecting my infant son, my wife, who is the love of my life, and who is now pregnant with my, my daughter. She gave me an ultimatum. And... Uh, she said, I love you, but I can't sit around and watch you kill yourself anymore. You have to make a choice. Your pills, your booze, or us. And I walked in the bathroom, and I dumped all those pills out, dumped that jack out, and I, and I wanted to seek help. My wife, never gave up on me, stayed by my side, and pushed me to go to church. I started to have a relationship with, with God, and I met a senior pastor who changed my life. This senior pastor was a pro, senior pro-level shooter, and he had an old Matthews bow, and he said, Dave, you're a lost person. I wanna give you a mission again. And he handed me a Matthews adrenaline and said, I'm gonna teach you archery, because you need to focus to be able to put that pin on the target and shoot. It's one of the greatest things that's ever been given to me. humbling when you when you take off that selfishness and you and you live your life with open hands and say okay I'm, I'm gonna do this for you God I'm gonna do what you want me to do when you're obedient to that calling it's just amazing what what he'll do with it So I met David Wooten back in January of 2021. He had emailed our company in regards to a military discount. The depth of his email and just everything that he had done and just the way that he explained himself and he articulated himself, I knew that I, I wasn't just gonna email him back. I had to have a conversation with him and we instantly hit it off. Uh, it's like somebody that you feel like you've known for 20 years and yeah, this was the first time I was talking to this man on the phone and he just, he has such a powerful story, um, such a powerful testimony about his faith and some of the struggles I've had in my personal life parallel David's. And so we, we instantly hit it off and we just, we clicked. Um, and getting to know him, hearing his story even more and just appreciating him for the, for the man that he is and everything that he's overcome 
it really made me realize pretty quickly that I think the focus of HHA USA was going to shift more, not away from the honor flight, but more towards our veterans and getting bows and arrows in their hands, just knowing the impact that that had on David's life. Seeing what archery had done for members of our of our armed services. Um, I think about uh, another gentleman. His name's Ryan Lonergan. He's from Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, suffers from PTSD. Uh, actually attempted suicide unsuccessfully twice. Uh, I'm going to take a break for a minute if that's all right. We kind of bared our souls to each other and, and have become very good friends and he only recently started shooting a bow a year ago and he is now completely sold out on the sport of archery and so just to see the the, the smile on his face, I think he ended up coming to three or four of our shoots this year. And um, just, a, just another great example of what putting a bow and arrow in a veteran's hand can do. So um, going forward, I just, I see a lot more, I see a lot more David Wootens and a lot more Ryan Lonergans in our future. I think there are, there are people out there that are, are hurting, that need somebody to come alongside them. Uh, the outdoor community needs to come alongside them and that is the position that we are taking you know going forward with HHA USA we are on a we are on a mission mission 22 um, you know 22 veterans a day take their lives and that number is not acceptable I'm doing this because it's it's been a blessing to work with the veteran community. It's humbling, it's very humbling to, to serve people. And for the first 40 years of my life, I was all about Chris Ham. What can I do to, to forward Chris Ham's agenda? And now it's not about my agenda, it's about the God that I serve. And we owe it to our veterans and the men and women that serve our country, that protect our freedoms, that allow us to own archery businesses, that allow us to start nonprofits, that allow us to sit in a tree stand on an October morning and watch the sun come up, because we wouldn't have what we have without them. The way I got here was Randy was planning this trip. This has been on my radar. I've known about muskox hunting in Alaska. Something I've looked at, really cool animal. There's the brutality of the hunt is what appeals to me. Just straight up, I want like, I like the brutal stuff. Randy starts talking to me about how it's a little bit different than that. I need a cameraman. We're at the Western Hunt Expo. We're in line at some barbecue place and waiting to order our food. And was like, hey, I'm all down to do it. You got to talk my wife into it. And by the time we <laughs> ordered our food, she turned to me and she goes, looks like you're going to Greenland. So I got the green light to come be the cameraman and still wasn't on my radar to even kill one. And I was like, hey, it's going to be cool to go over here and check this out. Knock a couple countries off stamps on my passport. Well, for me, this hunt started in 2012 with watching Kurt from Bow Hunter Magazine do this hunt. And when I seen this muskox hunt on TV, it made me want to do it. And I think another reason I want to do it is because not too many of my friends killed the muskox and I wanted that experience. I wanted to go to the like the last frontier type where there's no people, no electricity. 
I saw a blurb online about bow hunting muskox, I think in 2014 or 15, um, from a local guy back home, and then ever since I've been trying to figure out how to do it. Well, we just hit shore here, and we've seen some muskox over on this side. There's some right there, and then there's some back on this hill here. So we've got three groups of muskox already. So I think we're really getting excited about right now. I've seen them in TV. I've seen them on magazines, and I've even seen mounts like at Bass Pros and Cabela's. But to see them run across the mountains and all that hair just flowing <laughs> and that white spot yeah. just gone, yeah. it's, it's it's magical. It's, yeah, I it's, mean, it's I can't think of any other animal that's even close to the way they run, the way they look when they when they yeah. run across the mountainside. Well, it's, when they're walking, they're not trotting, but when they walk fast from a distance, they're floating. Yeah. You're not seeing an arch or a hump or they're just floating, this giant, it looked like a caterpillar, just floating. Yeah. Across <laughs> yeah, the like you can't see their legs. No. The hair goes yeah. down and gets brushed off by the ground. And it's just, yeah. it's just a, it's a jiggling. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was pretty intense when we stood up on them. I didn't realize there were so many and they circled and I drew and just as soon as I was breaking the shot, he took a step and I hit him a little far back. He's not wanting to walk. He's not wanting to go nowhere. So that's a good sign and we're gonna to try to stalk up on him here in about 30 more minutes. It's been seven years yeah. waiting on this shot. Yeah, yeah. I was a little nervous, I gotta be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. most people are. <laughs> well, I had seven years of anticipation built up for this hunt. Yeah, yeah. I'm just super honored to yeah. be able to hunt with you. Most people get a little nervous when they see this close up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't nervous, scared, it was just uh, yeah, yeah. the anticipation being built up over all the time, the 50 hours to get here and and just the whole situation's been been awesome. Yeah. I mean, and now we got a little bit of snow, the mountains are covered, and yeah. I'm soaking wet. Yeah. But it's, it's been good. Yeah. I grossly underestimated the physical part of this hunt. Yeah. The muskot wasn't bad, because yeah. we just sort of stayed in the rolling hills. But the caribou part of this hunt, yeah. he said it was up high, <laughs> but <laughs> high didn't bother me. But when it's 60 degrees, yeah. high, straight up. And boulders and boulders and 60 one degrees. boulder to the next. And then yeah. you'll step on a boulder and it'll roll and you'll do the splits or roll your ankle. He sent me the sheet where it said for caribou, be prepared for sheep shape. Sheep shape. I've been on sheep hunts. I've been a lot of sheep hunts. I've filmed almost the entire slam. And I was like, sheep shape. <laughs> and we start hiking for your caribou. No, and I was like, sheep yeah, shape. sheep shape. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, yeah, this sheep is. shape. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I got humbled a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, we finally got spotted a caribou after, well, this is the fourth day, so, and I'm going for it.
I ran his team at 60 yards, and as soon as he stopped, I took a shot. It looks a bit high, but they said he walked a couple hundred yards and he got real wobbly and he fell over. So we're gonna give it 30, 40 minutes, let it, let it calm down, and then we'll go try to recover him. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all your help. I still wasn't planning on shooting one. I was just planning on coming here and checking it out. But it's just a once in a lifetime experience. So after everybody tagged out, then Frank looked at me and goes, Hey, are you going to do it? And, yeah, I'm going to do yeah. it. <laughs> and after watching these animals, it was, yeah. it was way cool. Randy and Troy tagged out on caribou yesterday. So today, Cole and Chad are going after caribou and I get to go after a muskox. So we came up way north, about an hour, almost hour, 30 minute boat ride up north, completely different valley. And there's just muskox everywhere, but we're not seeing any bulls. So we're just hiking around, looking for bulls, looking for bulls. And at some point we got to find one because we're looking at a ton of muskox and we're only half a mile from the boat right now. So. Pretty excited, it's gonna be an awesome day. It's been an amazing trip so far. This country is just unreal gorgeous. It reminds me a lot of Alaska. Just rugged, pure beauty. I love everything about it. It snowed on us, it's rained on us, it's sleeted on us. Yesterday we were in t-shirts, the day before that we were bundled up. This morning we were so cold in that boat that <laughs> when we got off, we just started hiking straight uphill just to warm up. It's been one heck of a cool experience. Just an amazing area. I, I can't say enough cool things about this. It's, it's by far one of the coolest hunts I've ever been on in my life. And these animals are just crazy. The way they walk, the way they flow. I can't wait to get close to one and get it. Hopefully put an arrow in one, so. Yeah. Iron wheels, baby. Iron wheels. <laughs> Unreal. Unreal. Go ahead and tell I me about it. No. I can't thank Randy and Willie enough and Frank. I called Willie before we came because we found out they had an extra tag and asked him if he minded if I took it. And he's like, if Randy tags out and you got the footage you need, do it. And holy cow, I got here, talked to Frank, and thank you so much, man. I, yeah, <laughs> this is definitely falls in the once in a lifetime opportunity for me, and what an unreal animal. This year I set out to make a film different than anything else I'd ever done. Different than anyone else had ever done. I mean, that's the point, right? And I've kind of struggled, honestly. This industry is in a whole different place than when I started. There was a lot more respect and support for one another, no matter the brand or style in which you chose to hunt. Trying to find that unifying message is getting harder all the time.
When I sit here and think about the film festivals I've been to and the different films that I've seen, it's getting harder and harder to make a film like nobody has ever seen before. For a while, just the gear you had could separate you from the pack. One drone shot or a slow motion camera made the difference. Now that everyone can get their hands on quality gear, it seems like, it brings it all back to the story and how it's put together. I've been inspired by a lot of films and filmmakers through the years. What started with pioneers like Gordon Eastman quickly expanded with other talented filmmakers throughout the outdoor and hunting industry. But cinema as a whole is just over 100 years old. What started as silent motion pictures was quickly changed by the advent of sound. Technology was moving fast, and so were production levels. If you think about it in the context of music, musicians have been creating brilliant music for years using the exact same instruments. And I think filmmakers will do the same, constantly evolving. The point is to make a film worth watching when I'm gone, and you can't force it out here. Whatever film I make is going to get criticized. That's just part of it. But criticism and failure are necessary for growth. Lord knows I've had my fair share of both through the years. One of the very first real films I did had some positive and some real negative comments. Pick up some tiny rocks and throw them into the chute above him to simulate. That's me on the cliff above the mountain goat. I was in the middle of making my first hunting film and about to learn a hard lesson in filmmaking. Not only did I miss this mountain goat with my bow, but because of how I ended the film, some people felt like I was trying to tell a different story than what actually happened. And looking back on it, I can see why now. I came away with that agreeing with that trying to be cinematic can go too far. I've done it myself. I'd learn things I'd do again, and things I never would. But that's how we get better. Man, that's hard to believe. I'd be going right at him. So weird. Since I've started, I've worked hard to get a mix of cinematic shots yet shots that put the viewer right in my shoes. People want to know the story they are watching is the story that actually happened. I've never wanted to just make a film for the sake of doing it either. There has to be a bigger message than just look at me and this animal I'm hunting. Do I have personal goals while out hunting? Of course I do, but I don't think most people care about my personal goals. I think they want to know how it relates to them and how it affects their lives. What's the bigger picture?
I keep thinking that eventually this awesome storyline is going to hit me in the face, or that something is going to happen out here that basically writes this story for me. As each day passes, I start to wonder if that moment is even going to happen this year. And I realized the story had been writing itself this entire time. I had created a film different than anything I had ever done. This one wasn't about some epic moment or movement. This film was created for a whole different reason. I made this film to tip my hat to all those who have helped shape this path for me. To those that have inspired me and to the critics. One thing I do know is when you make a hunting film, you not only represent yourself, you may end up representing all of us. Everyone has a unique story to tell, and this is just part of mine. Creating a film comes with a responsibility. A responsibility not only amongst ourselves, but to those outside the hunting community. And that responsibility is respect. I'm here with a bow on this hunt, really because I'm an archer through and through. Archery is just deep in my bones and it's just, it's just how I feel most comfortable in the woods. brought a very special broadhead to me and I know a very special broadhead to Josh it's the um, broadhead that we use to kill Bigfoot and I hope I get to give it to Josh at the end of this hunt that's what I want to do do my tag. <laughs> yeah. A lot of sucking up going on. Right. Hey, do you have it? <laughs> what? Do you have it? I have it. Where? Little lets you know that if his man gets drunk in the, the future, right. he has to give it to me. Yeah, right. 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 I gotta That's have my deal. chance, right? We just like to do the little switch around, yeah. you know. Yeah. Trade off. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. What? You can't pull back that bow. I can pull back a bow. have her own. And I can use a gun. A moose 
moose hunted in zone one 26 years ago and uh, I shot a bull moose with a gun and after reflecting on that experience and years going by it just became really apparent to me that if I ever got to go moose hunting again I'd want to do it with a bow you know if I actually get to draw and and harvest a bull that's even better just to be in the thick timber that close to a moose that's why I'm here the goal was to find some cows and we just found some I think I just heard two down there so we gotta hunt the cows I think we know what we're doing tomorrow. As the sun sets. We are starting to get lower. We're starting to get below. Get up to that corner, look at the map, but we might be able to drop it in. Oh, I'm good, man. Good. He's a beast, John. That was the dream. That was the dream. <laughs> I talked about the dream, and that was the dream right there. That's it. Josh, <laughs> I can't even believe it. Oh, God. That was it. Bigfoot with that, is it? Yeah. Don't shoot that until I'm over your shoulder. Yeah. Alright. All right. Sounds good. I would say he's bleeding out of his nose right there. 
which means that lung blood's coming up. Is that a moose right there? The moment of being crouched on the ground, having my heart beat out of my mouth. And hearing As, him coming through the alders. I mean. Yeah, no, I was in I was in disbelief. I with everything, all the hiking and tracking we've been doing over the last three days, I just thought how how could we possibly get so fortunate? How could John get so fortunate once again? Because yeah. you do a lot. Such a big, beautiful animal, and I just never dreamt, never dreamt he'd be so big, never dreamt he'd come so close. It was the most still I've <laughs> crouched probably my whole life. It was really amazing. Never forget this adventure, you guys. This elk trip was a heavy one. Not many people can recognize when they're about to go on the best hunt of their life. For some, it's a big animal. And if you're lucky, it's about more than that. It's about what led you to this hunt. My grandma Omi was adventurous. She loved to travel. When I think of her, I would remember her saying, oh, the places you'll see. Those words still ring in my head often. Yay! Nikki got it! Nikki got it! Before she passed, I was lucky enough to spend some time with her. We sat there and talked about a lot of things, a lot of which will always stay between us. But there was one favor she asked of me, and that was to take Joe on what might be his last elk hunt. And this is that story. Omi loved to document everything. It was only fitting that I would leave Joe with a picture from what we would both look back on and say that was our favorite hunt. That was 13 years ago. It don't seem like 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Remember I had a little beard, I had like yeah. a couple little hairs. You were proud of them too. I was, yeah, I was proud of them. I have a picture of you and Omi though. Yeah. Yeah. She was proudest of all. One more. <clears throat> you and she. I think you had it at your wedding. Lots of stories. Thank you. 
Hold on, Joe. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see the bull, Joe? See the horns right there on the top of the horn. Right there, he's stepping out right now. Someone once said we'd take pictures to stop time, to commit moments to eternity. I could have given Joe any picture from that trip. It was a reminder of the laughs we shared and the moments we had on the mountain, something none of us will ever forget.
I didn't choose this picture because of the trophy. It was because this is the moment we were reminded who we were there for. We were there for Omi. You got him, boy. You hit him. You got him. You got him, Jojo. You got him, brother. <laughs> Omi's bowl right there. To say that trying to be a hunter and a producer at the same time poses some challenges, well, that's a little bit of an understatement. And when things finally do go as planned, Nipsey, a buck that has so much potential, and even though the survival rate in New York we know is not great, we just had to let this deer go one more year. Man, that, that was my best, rack-wise. That was by far my best pass in New York. I mean, you'll watch that and say, you're, you're nuts. And, and we are a little nuts. But man, if that deer makes it, he is going to be a hoss. He was four yards from the tree. Four yards. <laughs> Unbelievable, my heart was pounding. It's easy to second guess yourself when you pass up a deer like that. At least for me it is. But we got pictures of Nipsey after last year's season and damn Dave and I were excited. After watching him blow up over the summer, we knew that this deer was going to be our main focus going into the 2021 season. On the second day of the season, you know, going into a spot where we normally wait until like November to, I mean, it's getting back in there. It's, it's pushing the limits. I mean, it's getting super aggressive. But you got daylight pictures pretty frequently of them in this particular area. The spot is, this is it. This is, this is it. To this day, I'm still not quite sure what happened, but man, when you put all the time, the work, the focus into one deer, you make every decision right and put yourself right in the middle of things on the second day of the season. And just like that, 
a perfect self-filmed opportunity, and it felt like the season was over. You know, I felt bad for Dino after that. That's a tough one to take on the chin, especially when you put so much hard work in. You think opportunities like that should be automatic. But self-filming is so hard. Even on scenarios like that where everything is perfect, you're still worried about so many things. Is the deer in frame? Is the camera focused? All the while trying to get into kill mode to make a good shot. After that, Nipsey kind of disappeared. We didn't see much of him during the rut. We got picked back up on our rut week as Uncle Jay and Dean went back to back on two of our other hit listers in New York. White jelly right there. Oh my god, dude, we got him. We got him. <laughs> oh my god. You know what they say when the surfing is good, get pitted. And I'm not gonna lie, after the success of Dino and Uncle Jay, I was ready to ride the wave. Self-filming, man. It saved him. I can't believe it. I am sick. I am sick. I'm not going to lie. That one hurt a little bit. Not as often as you'd think does a mystery giant run right underneath you. Especially in New York. I guess you got to be grateful for opportunities like that, right? Sometimes meant to be doesn't make any sense until it does. Holy shit. This is insane. Probably not too many people out in this stuff tonight. It is an absolute blizzard out here a freaking blizzard but I like it because the New York Bucks love 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 the adverse weather conditions they love it you know when Vince Vaughn and, and wedding crashes is like sailing is like sex to these people they love it well Adverse weather is like sex to these big bucks. They love it. So get out your chains and whips and let's get freaky. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny.
you guys. I got a freaking. You guys. You guys. I just stuck Nipsey. Oh my god. I gotta admit, when we went down there, I was a little nervous. But as we kept tracking and the blood picked up, I knew this deer couldn't be far. There's no way. Look at that buck. Look oh, at that freaking shit. buck. Thank you, Lord. A buck of a freaking lifetime with my bow and rifle season. Oh, Look at that deer, dude. Look, Look at that freaking buck. <laughs> Look at that freaking buck. As you can tell from our season, being a bow hunter and a producer at the same time poses its challenges. Trying to bring someone else with you who's not with you when you have nobody else with you, <laughs> that shit's hard. But on November 28th, 2021, it all happened perfectly. And those challenges we faced throughout the season helped me self-film and self-produce a bow hunt on a buck we only dream about. To do it on the land that you grew up on, that for years you've poured your blood, sweat, and tears into, and to celebrate with the people that got you started, that makes it perfect. Thank you for the chase and for the sacrifice, Nipsey. Memories are made from moments. Moments so engraving that we will go to great lengths to recreate and relive the feeling that a moment brought us. We flew into camp yesterday and obviously can't hunt in the days you fly, but we set up camp, got all settled, and we glassed all last night and saw pile of moose and a really big bear. So in most places you'd say they're big and here they're just another bull. So we gotta find the, uh, the special one. Every bow hunter yearns for that one moment. You could spend a lifetime searching for that moment. The moment when the distractions of the world go silent and you realize the moment you came for is the moment you are in.
Lance will let us go shoot him, but they don't see plenty that I would shoot, but now it's not something he just called a couple of us right to us, which was pretty awesome. And uh, we had about another hour, hour and a half back, back to camp, and then get some dinner, get some sleep, and do it again tomorrow. As a hunter, the moment we strive to reach is no secret. From sharing priceless time with the people we care about, to being self-reliant on gathering our next meal. These moments are secondary to the one moment. That moment when we release the arrow and feel the rush of emotions flying through the air at what seems to be the slowest 300 feet per second of our lives. Tons of snow the last 24 hours. Moose can't hide in this. I mean, black moose and white snow ought to be pretty easy to find. We just gotta, again, find them in the right spot and be able to get to them. So, another day, day seven. No matter how many times we play in our minds what we think that moment will be, it's the unpredictability of how that moment comes that forever stamps the image into our minds. Looking back, I see it it's the thought that it hasn't happened yet, or might not even happen, that creates the anticipation the for when it does. All our memories feel this house, like a thief, they steal my heart. We got a bull from yesterday that we found, kind of made a move, kind of lost some lost time in the day and we're headed back over there now just head up the canyon on the other side of the river and see if we can find this this bull he should be there he hasn't moved in two days so we just need time to get over there Whether you are in search of the moment alone or in company, the moment remains a constant. The moment when a steady hand is the hardest to hold. And the loudest of distractions are impossible to hear. Me, that moment comes in the final few seconds. I didn't arrange him. I just, I knew he was going to be within 50. Does not get any freaking better than that. These moments are not promised, and we don't get to embrace them often. They're not easily obtained and are constantly threatened. The moments we have lived fuel the moments we create. Hello, darling. I smashed him with my bow at 40.
moments should drive us to never stop chasing those final few seconds. <laughs>